Uh, welcome to today's program. My name is uh, Glenn Deason. I'm a professor of political science. With me is uh, Alexander Mercuris from the very popular Duran. And the guest today is uh, Alistair Crook, uh, who's an yeah, excellent uh, background uh, from uh, extensive diplomacy. Uh, today, we're going to discuss some of the intelligence failure in Israel and uh, also uh, thereafter a bit about uh, uh, the Western approach uh, to Russia and perhaps support for somewhat uh, unsavory uh, political groups. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, let's just uh, jump straight into it. Uh, we, we now have a war again in Israel. Uh, uh, Alistair, how how do you see this? What 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 caused all of this? Uh, 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 how did this happen? Uh, could you uh, uh, give us an overview? Um, yes, I'll try to do it and uh, briefly because I think many people um, haven't really understood the context, uh, and the un the context is really important. You know, it just hasn't just happened out of the blue that Hamas have decided to, you know, go through the fence and attack Israel. There is a background to it, and it's a background that goes back quite a long way. But it's reached its apex. It's reached its sort of crucial point at the moment. Uh, the the first point that is really um, key to understand is uh, that there has been a schism in Israel that is profound. And the two sides are more or less equally balanced. In fact, um, the balance in parliament and the balance has been in, in I mean, electoral terms shifting towards what is now called the right. It's a coalition, in fact, uh, of groups of, of the national religious and the settler uh, and um, or, or other groups. Um, and that is now, if you like, uh, has a majority in the Knesset. The parliament um, in Israel. Now, these this group has a completely different vision of the future of Israel. <clears throat> they don't accept the status quo, the, the status quo uh, about a sort of occupation that is convenient for um, most Israelis, that it seems until the day before yesterday, seem to be working quite well. And uh, they want to move to establishing what they see as the original purpose of Israel, which was to establish, if you like, Israel on the land of Israel. That means the West Bank and the historic lands of Israel, which does not coincide with the actual Israel today. Um, and they also want to remove the ability of the Supreme Court to overthrow the laws that are produced by the parliament in which they are a majority, because uh, they believe the Supreme Court is basically um, a, a sort of a, a, a secular liberal structure institution, uh, which is designed to perpetuate um, the status quo. Um, and the, the important really point is, and this is what was so dramatic a little while ago when one could see images coming out of the Prime Minister's office in Israel. It was Mizrahi that was coming out of there. Now, many of your viewers and listeners may not realize the Mizrahi are the Oriental Jews. These are the Jews that come from North Africa and from the Middle East, but they've always been the underclass. They have been the sort of rather deprecated underclass of Israel year after year. And they've built themselves up and they now take an office. And they have been complaining often and they've been saying, listen, listen, you know, so often we fight the election and, and we take office but we're never in power because the establishment stops us doing what we want, which is to not only establish, if you like, the land, Israel on the land of Israel, they want to reestablish Judaism, not in a secular way, but in a religious Judaism. And they even want 
and this is part of their complaint against the Supreme Court, they want to return to Jewish law, halakha, which is, um, if you like, I mean, people might see some sort of resonances with what's happened in the Islamic world, and Sharia, and the establishment of a you know, caliphate and a, a, a legitimate. I don't know whether that's a good metaphor to make, but this nonetheless is what is uh, happening. So this is the point to really understand. You have two big, powerful blocks in Israel, Mizrahi, and then the secular, if you like, liberal um, elites of Herzliya and Tel Aviv clashing about what is the future vision of Israel on which there's no agreement, what is the past of Israel upon which there's no agreement, and what is the way to go forward on which there's no agreement. So um, that is the background of where we are. But the most important points, um, that um, the, the most important commitments, um, that these have been, they're nothing new. These, I, I remember the present justice minister laid out the plan for this 10 years ago at a conference uh, in Israel. And he said, you know, it's going to take time, but this is where we're going. And the two commitments were to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. Um, that was absolutely the case. And then the secondly was to establish Israel on um, the land of Israel. Now, just to be clear so that people understand, rebuilding the temple on Haram al-Sharif, Temple Mount, means demolishing Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, establishing, if you like, um, the land of Israel, Israel on the land of Israel, means, if you like, removing many Palestinians from the West Bank and removing what political rights they have which is one of the reasons this fight is going on. So this is uh, what has been happening. Um, and I remember even, even um, years ago when I was lent, I was um, seconded to the American government to be part of the team of uh, Senator Mitchell, fact-finding committee into the First Intifada. And of course, what started the First Intifada? Uh, the visit to al by Sharon. Even then, I remember some of Sharon's uh, guides, he actually sent me off on a tour around the settlements with his great friend, the intelligence officer, Rafi Aitan. And at the time, uh, uh, the point of this was to see that the settlements would never be reversed. And he sent me around and he told them to speak to me, you know, in clear terms, which they did. And um, then it was pretty clear that Sharon's visit was about raising the, the if you like, the profile of religious nationalism, um, which we see sitting in the government today, and an organization which was tiny then, tiny when I first knew it, the Temple Mount Movement, about rebuilding the temple. These people are deadly serious. They now have seats in cabinet and are going ahead with it. And they've already brought three red heifers over to Israel, um, preparing them for sacrifice at the point at which it, this temple is, starts to be rebuilt. And uh, regard, r recall, this is not something um, that is just a sort of little far, you know, um, outlier in the case. The whole of the Israeli cabinet met not so long ago, I think about two months maybe or so ago, in the tunnels under Al-Aqsa and said, <coughs> this is ours. We claim it. This territory is ours. And they were sitting precisely underneath the third holiest site in Islam. So just to finish the story, sorry it takes a little long, but it's uh, important because I think so little of this um, context is really un understood more, wide, uh, more widely. Two years ago, when um, the settlers stormed Al-Aqsa um, and uh, Hamas started firing rockets into Tel Aviv, I don't know if you recall, it was about two years ago, this happened. 
Um, and the Hamas called it, and this was so important, called it, this is the intifada of Al-Aqsa. We are there to save Al-Aqsa. Not Hamas, not the Palestinian cause, not nationalism, but this is about Al-Aqsa. And that we will protect Al-Aqsa. And what happened was unparalleled. The West Bank rose up and for the first time, what we call uh, the 79 Palestinians, the Palestinians from that were that are in 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 Israel, but who um, uh, 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 are there as the citizens of Israel, they rose up too. And you may remember it; it was a very violent place. Well, what happened just a few days ago? I mean, on Saturday we had this raid, um, but on Thursday, 800 um, uh, radical settlers with the support of the security forces, stormed and invaded Al-Aqsa again. It's not even mentioned, I think, very much in much of the press. But this is a, a really important trigger. Why, so you asked me, the first question was intelligence failure. Listen, I could see this coming. Others can see, see this was building. We're building because, of course, you know, what we're talking about is the Palestinians facing another al-Nakba if this really went ahead and if Palestinian is, uh, if you like, Israel is founded on the land of Israel and the, if you like the cleansing of Palestinians. It's coming to, 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 to very much to a head. And then uh, on Thursday, if you like, I mean, we saw 800 coming on to the, uh, on, on uh, invading uh, uh, Al-Aqsa and the Temple Mount um, uh, to make this point uh, and then afterwards we had what you saw on Saturday and I don't think it was for me, me it was not such a surprise therefore I mean there was a straight line linking what I saw with Sharon's visit from that time uh, and the purpose and incidentally Sharon's um, I think it was his his assistant said to me, he said, listen, at the moment, we can't establish Israel uh, you know, on the land of Israel. We can't establish the land of Israel. But the prime minister, i.e. Sharon, he, he foresees the time when America is sufficiently weak and it will be possible to do that. And we will, we will do that. It may take some time to get there. Um, and so this has been in the works for a long time. Why do Western intelligence services get blindsided? Well, I'll tell you very simply is one is hubris. Um, they think, you know, the Palestinians are not particularly competent at these things and that they're rather backward people. I mean, just as we, they thought the same. I'm not, this is not against the Palestinians because I remember during the 2006 war, the, the 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 naval head of intelligence in Israel made in the Knesset the extraordinary comment. He said, "We didn't put any of our defense systems on on the ship that was attacked by by Hezbollah." He said, "You know, because our, our intelligence people had told us, you know, that Hezbollah rode on donkeys and wouldn't have any capability." Uh, and I'm sure it's not like that now. That's you know that's an old story and long since changed. But really, the bottom story is, is this, you know, the move to technical intelligence. You, first of all, you get too much intelligence. I mean, you know, someone quoted this week in, the, in, in one of the Israeli papers, you know, Shinbeck can see into every bedroom. Oh, fine, that's great. But, you know, who has the experience to understand that one sentence that is important? Amid millions of language and recorded conversations and things, what's the one that really is the beginning of a change and is important? And I just think, you know, all of that is gone. The technical side has, has sort of swamped it. And it's the same. We've seen this in Ukraine with the Western uh, services getting it so wrong uh, there because they don't... Um, you know, if you demean the people that you are, uh, who are your adversaries, 
and don't understand them enough and don't try to understand them, then you won't recognize the key point. And the last thing, of course, is I think that Western intelligence services don't understand, if you like, um, uh, symbolic meaning. AXA means something quite different. It's not just any mosque. It means something absolutely integral to Muslims, Shi and Sunni alike. I stop. Sorry. Well, I think what you've said is absolutely momentous because if this is going to be an attack on, if there's a, a preparation for an eventual attack and ultimate demolition of Al-Aqsa, well, I am not somebody who is particularly versed in Islamic uh, history or Middle East history, but even I can see that's going to be momentous. I mean, it, what would be the effect of that? Not just on the Palestinians, but on the wider uh, uh, Islamic world. Uh, I mean, would we see turmoil? I mean, would we see uh, uh, events of, uh, you know, epochal significance? I mean, how, 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 how do you measure or discuss or predict such a thing? I mean, it would be the start of something, something colossal, uh, and something that we are completely unprepared for in the West. And by the way, you're absolutely correct. I only found out about this incursion into Al-Aqsa that happened last week. I only found out about it uh, yesterday. Uh, and and you know, I'm not somebody who doesn't follow the news in the West. Exactly. It's not being reported. Even people who do ind independent media haven't been writing about it. Because we in the West are, are, are very stuck in our sort of very um, mechanical rationality. And they, so we don't understand you know, the huge <coughs> meaning that Al-Aqsa has. And as I say, it's both for Shi and Sunni. Now, in a, in a certain way, I mean, the security minister, Ben Gavir, has been absolutely committed. He's committed to rebuilding the, um, the temple and therefore demolishing the mosque at some point. And, um, and the provocations go on week after week. And what's changed so much is that he controls the police and the security apparatus. And before they would keep people, the, the, the radicals, the extremists, out of the mosque, in order to try and preserve some sort of calm. But now they are totally in line with Ben Gavir and the radical element in, in, the, in, the, um, in the government, in Netanyahu's government now, uh, which is pursuing this. So uh, <coughs> in a way, you can wonder if what Hamas did was an attempt to preempt the big vision, the big effect, that it was not just a reaction to last Thursday, but an action to uh, preempt and to bring to a head, if you like, events that were building and accumulating and would lead to something that would be out of their control rather than in their control. So, um, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I'm not privy to all the, the things, but yes, it was not. I mean, what happened was didn't surprise me at all. <laughs> In fact, I expected it, and I thought this would be coming at some point. I mean, you know, the the details of it, I was not were, were not. Uh, I don't know, don't know. Um, but you, you only have to look at what's happened to see it was clearly very well planned and very well thought through. And, you know, it seems to me the next stages are also quite um, clear um, and quite dangerous, but I don't suppose the West is thinking much about it, and certainly the Israelis are not. Um, Israel has promised to go into Gaza, um, and it's assembling a big force to do that. Well, I, I know Gaza quite well. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's the most you know, the worst sort of urban area if you wanted to conduct military warfare. <laughs> it's a jumble of houses. It's a mess. And um, 
you know, I mean, people have this idea, but they don't really understand it. I mean, how do you tell a Hamas member? I mean, you go into Gaza, there are three and a half million people, lots of men and young youths. How do you tell them? I mean, you can't. It's something that they think and something that they belong to. I mean, they're not sitting there in uniforms and sort of, ah, you know, he's in green, bang, and he's dead. It's not like that. I, I suspect that, you know, the, the, these people are not stupid. They knew that because this is the usual Israeli answer is to come and bomb Gaza and even to come into it and to invade it. So that's the first part, which I think is expected and what shall happen. Then what next will be, we wait to see what happens from the north. Um, Hamas has said that we are you know, prepared, all are mobilized for perhaps the final unfolding of, of plans of the, I can't remember the exact words they used, but something like that. You can see them their formal statement. And they've been firing they've been firing into <coughs> missiles into the Shabar farms. Shabar farms occupied by or at least part occupied by Israel. And um, Israel took a little bit more recently, which resulted in Hezbollah setting up a tent again on internationally claimed Lebanese territory, but which Israel occupies. <coughs> so Hezbollah is starting the war of the sovereignty of Lebanon gently in the north with a few um, missiles. They've destroyed three Israeli radar sites, in fact, on the Shabar farms in the last few days. I don't know if that's been much in the press, but they have destroyed three radar places, all in the Shabar farms, which is, um, uh, strictly speaking, and recognized as, the, I mean, but it's not um, sort of implemented, but is claimed Lebanese territory. And there's good reasons for that claim. I mean, even the Americans would say there's good cause for that claim. Uh, and um, Israel has been responding with artillery back into Lebanon. So I think this is really how we watch the unfolding steps. I don't think it's going to go that quickly, but it could move more quickly than people expect. And for now, I think that we will find Israel entering into a quagmire into Gaza. Um, I mean, I was in Israel during the first intifada, and you know the fighting in. I saw the fighting in the north, in in Nablus, and um, in other cities. I mean, you know, it's door to door. I mean street to street, um, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be at all easy. And then there's the questions of the hostages. And none of those are, none of those are really dealt with. I mean, you know, I, I've had to do hostage negotiations before, uh, once with uh, hostages in, uh, in Al-Aqsa and several times since, I mean, either individuals or uh, the Israeli government asked me to negotiate with Hezbollah the return of bodies or prisoners held by Hezbollah. Uh, you know, it's not it's not as straightforward as people think. You have to start off. You've got to know who you've got. I mean, you know, because Israel will determine the price it's going to offer, determining on who is a hostage and whether they're women or men or fighters or what or whether they're wanted men and things. So uh, all of this is going to take a lot of time and, uh, and effort, and then the negotiations have to begin. And, um, uh, I, you know, that is not easy either. Someone has to be given a mandate to do it. And, you know, sometimes the Israelis have sort of turned to a country like Egypt to try and do this, but I don't know who they'll, if they'll choose someone, but, 
the old rule of hostage um, hostages, I mean, which I, I recall well is, if you don't open a channel of communication, I have someone who has a mandate to negotiate within the first week, then you spend a year or two years negotiating about how to negotiate a channel for the release of hostages. So I think all of this is sort of, you know, part, and, and clearly this was, you know, thought through before from what we've seen on the ground. I think it's quite clearly thought through um, by people. I, I was curious, you, I found it interesting, uh, you talk about the schisms within Israel, but I was curious, who, uh, who would the United States uh, well, usually support? I mean, because often one gets the impression that the United States would uh, support more of the hard, hardliners, but uh, uh, you also mentioned that, uh, that Israel would likely wait uh, to implement this historical state of Israel until when the Americans were sufficiently weak. Um, because, uh, well, this schism, as you mentioned, often we, I think we miss it in the West because it's just one one Israel. However, when you, of course, turn to Israeli media, you get a very different view. Uh, I think it was only yesterday the uh, <coughs> editorial in Haaretz were blaming, uh, they're saying that Netanyahu was bearing the main responsibility for the war. And mm -hmm. the former head of Mossad only a month ago uh, argue that uh, you know Israel could uh, undermine its own security by imposing apartheid again the head Absolutely. of the Assad. so uh, so you you obviously have these divisions within Israel which well, doesn't really mm -hmm. appear in the Western media but that being said uh, why well, why would why would the weakness of the United States be required for the hardliners to advance their agenda because uh, the United States um, and very importantly. Um, reformist Jews overwhelmingly in the United States totally support the the secular um, liberal Ashkenazi component um, without a doubt um, and they are aghast by what Netanyahu and his right wing are doing and they detest it uh, and so America is fully supporting the protests against Netanyahu. Now, I'm not saying this, but Israeli correspondents, um, I, 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 if I don't want to give the name only because if I do, I might have got the wrong name or something, and got it wrong. But I mean, prominent left wing, if you like, correspondents of, you know, Haaretz and things like that, are saying, you know, there's effectively a coup d'etat underway in you remember that many of the military didn't turn up and were operating there, there's a division also within the army uh, at the very very top level it's always been in fact um, ashkenazi secular even kibbutznik um, and the army used to be run by kibbutznik uh, kibbutznik but um, then <coughs> uh, now even when I was there, we saw the settlers coming in. And now all of the command, like sort of at the colonel and the major level, is commanded by settlers who are totally in line with Ben Gavir and the rightist policy of establishing the taking the West Bank and establishing the land of Israel. So America is putting huge pressure to try and persuade Netanyahu to go back and um, rejoin with the Liberal, with the liberal secular world uh, 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 and with Gantz and Lapid, the sort of the leaders of the of the left in in in, in Israel, um, but and that's the, the protests. I mean, you know, the protests have been going on week after week after week, with for a long time. And you know, as you know, running protests of that size for that long takes a lot of money, and people ask where the money is coming from. Uh, and the prime minister asks where the money is coming on for the coming from from these protests. So you know this this what's happening in Israel is much more conflictual than probably people from the outside have have realized. Partly because Israel doesn't discuss this much outside of its own um, bubble, shall we say. Um, but it's much more and, and bitterly fought over. 
and the, the um, if you like, the Ashkenazi liberal left uh, are, are fighting to the very end to keep the Supreme Court in being. So what's the beef about the Supreme Court? Well, if you ask the Mizrahi in the government at the moment, they would say, just look at it. 15 members, 14 Ashkenazi, one Mizrahi. So they see it entirely as a, as a sort of instrument of secularism, mm -hmm. i.e. non-Judaism. These people aren't even really Judaic in, in, in the view, not I'm saying it, of the view of the, some of the, the, the people in, in who form the government today. I've only, I'm only going to go to one further question, which is that if we have a long war, and a war in Gaza, and it does turn into a quagmire. By the way, I mean, we all remember these wars. They start, people say they will go in and they will clear out the terrorists. <laughs> they, they said that in Lebanon, they said that in Afghanistan, and they turned into long, very debilitating wars. And in the case of Lebanon, of course, Israel was eventually largely pushed out. Will this, cre will this exacerbate this divide in Israel's, Isra Israeli society? What will it do to Israel itself if there's a long war? I mean, will we see further polarization, further radicalization? <coughs> I mean, <coughs> at the moment, there's a, a push on to uh, create a unity government, a wartime unity government. And that's normal. Um, I mean, traditional, shall I say, in Israel to do that in the in the wartime. But the blame game is 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 already started, and there's a sort of agreement that they should wait on the blame game, particularly on the military failures, till after they've um, after they've finished in Gaza. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think that you have to understand one important thing is that uh, uh, I show you know that, that Netanyahu is indicted and faces prison. Mm. But the only thing that stands between him and that are the right in his coalition. If he ceases to be a prime minister, then he likely will end up in prison. And so in many ways, um, the coalition lead Netanyahu rather than Netanyahu leads the coalition. And so he is not really free to sort of make new coalitions as easily as it's often assumed in Washington. And so um, I think uh, that as soon as, I, I think as soon as this will, will, will happen, um, uh, you know, as soon as we move to the next stage, um, the split will re re-emerge. The break will, will re-emerge. Already, the liberal press, if you read the liberal English-speaking press in Israel, they say, it's all the fault of Netanyahu and his right wing, which l distracted us and left us sort of at odds because we were all doing our protests and what have you, and we didn't see what was going to come. Uh, and then on the other side, um, uh, the Mizrahi elements, I call them Mizrahi, but I mean, because it's a coalition, it's difficult. the coalition says, yeah, but who was actually, you know, who was the chief of defense staff? Who are all these people? They're not Mizrahi, they're Ashkenazi. I mean, you know, come on, we're not going to take this, uh, that we're responsible for, uh, for, for, for the failure. We have to investigate the failure more, 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 more clearly. But it's true that um, uh, this sort of uh, clash, I think, is going to sort of emerge very strongly in the brain blame game um, quite shortly. I thought we should uh, yeah, can, uh, change uh, topic slightly. Uh, if yeah, you had yours uh, uh, to, to the other article you also had written now on uh, uh, on um, Reinhard Gehlen and uh, his role in uh, the the establishment of the CIA 
and also how this seemed to influence uh, Ukrainian policies to this day. Uh, again, it it becomes often, at least in the West area, yeah, it becomes a difficult topic to discuss because you know once you address the far right uh, and fascist groups in Ukraine, I'm told that you know it's merely Russian propaganda, and because Zelensky has Jewish ancestry, there's well, no more to discuss. But what is also fascinating is that uh, yeah, both Poroshenko and Zelensky were very much against the nationalists. <laughs> I would say they once they faced the dilemma of either having nationalists as a powerful ally or a powerful adversary. Uh, they both changed their position and aligned themselves with them quite closely, which therefore made peace with Donbass and Russia quite impossible. Uh, but the, to taking this back until uh, the end of World War II, uh, uh, c- could you elaborate on on your article about the role of uh, uh, Galen? Uh, Yes, I'm not. I, you know, I'm not. I'm very much aware that this is. These are sensitive issues, and I'm not trying to. But nonetheless, th- there is a fact because it was in fact the British who established OSS and the CIA, and also were involved in the process. There was a great uplift of, if you like, Germans who had fought against. Um, in the Second World War against Russia, uh, an uplift of these people to the United States um, in various fields, not particularly intelligence, and that's where the Galen organization, which was huge, I mean, employing 4,000 people uh, and double that with their sources, um, uh, uh, was there. Um, But also, of course, in science all the science technologists and the atomic project and everything. Um, we, the West, and I, I don't, this is not aimed at America because I'm saying it, it was Europe as a, I mean, the Britain and America, you know, uh, drained the expertise and the files that they could at the end of the war, which you can say was not, you know, not such a stupid thing perhaps to have done. But nonetheless, it had some sort of long tail consequences that we are still living with. And uh, one of them is, is, is the sense that, of course, you know, most of these people had been, you know, immersed in a war, two wars against Russia. Russia was deeply seen as a, an adversary, uh, you know, for, for most Germans who'd who'd fought in in the war was seen as an adversary. And, I mean, some of that ideas, because it ran up, I mean, the the American foreign policy default position was still rather that of Buchanan at that time, which was, you know, we don't want to get involved in these sort of things. First of all, let's keep a distance from it and definitely keep a distance from European wars and things. And that was so, it it did have, I think, an effect. But my point was much more about identity and the impact of this um, raising of the idea of warfare based on a clash of identities. And what happened, uh, and this is where the Ukrainians that were part of the Galen organization that had served in the Wehrmacht, um, in the Galicia division um, in during the war, um, uh, adopted uh, a, an identity which was sort of congruent with German identity. Uh, they tended to see themselves as having a, a Viking and a Germanic heritage. They were not Slavs in their view. They were Germanic um, and uh, Viking in the background. And therefore, this put them, you know, very closely in line uh, with German thinking. And German thinking at that time had been very much involved with identity. Um, <clears throat> you, uh, I mean, the idea, you know, from the 30s onwards, the idea of, uh, you know, the identity and your um, your inheritance, shall we say, that you you come with was clear. But in the Ukrainian case, uh, it's had this big impact on how we 
how we approach the, the war with Ukraine, because the Ukrainians continue to insist. I mean, now we're talking about West Ukrainians continue to insist that they are different, that they are not Slavs. I mean, and you have this, and it's, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is said by the head of the defense, the National Security Council. And he said, look, you know, those, the Russians, those are Asians. They're not like us. They're Asians. Asians are all right, but they're not human. And you have to understand that they're not human. I think I gave, I gave the, the, the exact words that Donald Love spoke, and it's reflected in the uh, underlining law that Zelensky put into basis that only Ukrainians of German extraction are entitled to full rights uh, and Tatars, I think it is, and some other case, but not ethnic Russians are excluded entirely uh, uh, from, from, uh, from this process. Uh, but just to be clear, I mean, there is absolutely no basis for that. There is no, no, nothing in the DNA of Western um, Ukrainians um, that separates them from Slavs. There's nothing in their language which is distinctly German. If anything, it's a sort of dialect of, of, of Russian. They claim it comes from old Germanic and old uh, roots, but there's no evidence for this. Mm -hmm. and, and this has caused this great problem. I mean, part of what, you know, why this after 2014 and the attacks on the Donbass, they were fighting Asians. You know, they weren't actually, they're not like us. They're not really human. I mean, and this is what the head of their National Security Council said about two years ago. They're not, you know, we, we don't treat them as humans. And so it, it's lent a very, <clears throat> you know, identitarian uh, uh, structure um, to the war. <clears throat> which makes the idea of negotiations extremely difficult. Firstly, because, I mean, it's got worse <laughs> over the period, the sort of identities. I, I talked a little bit about how, um, if you like, uh, <clears throat> uh, Brzezinski, Zibig Brzezinski, had used identity, first of all, in Afghanistan, where I was, I remember very clearly, and then setting it up, uh, you know, an Islamic identity, against the secular socialist identities that were prevalent through much of the Middle East at this time. Uh, uh, and and then, then in his book in 97 and said, how we destroy Russia is by stirring up the identity rivalry in Ukraine because we can use this as a means uh, um, uh, to, um, if you like, leverage against Russia and break up the idea of the heartland ever creating unity. Because without Ukraine, Russia will not be a power. With Ukraine, Russia will be a power. That's what he wrote. He was then Carter's national security advisor. Mm -hmm. And he'd been the one present, you know, persuaded Carter to uh, insert the Islamists into Afghanistan. Uh, and then he suggested this with Ukraine. Now, uh, <clears throat> How can Russia deal with this? Uh, and the short answer is they can't, because it's a false identity. There's no doubt. I mean, West Ukrainians and East Ukrainians are Slav. I mean, this, they're culturally, they're linguistically, they are uh, Slav. So to try and negotiate it, that, and this is where it's become so complicated and dangerous, is because, um, you know, what... The implication of what you know they are saying when they say this is that you know Europe goes to the Dnieper River. That's Europe. I mean, genetically and culturally and linguistically, it goes to the Dnieper, and after that is Asia. And somehow this has started to slip into certain parts of uh, you know language and, and thinking in Brussels, and you hear them talking about the European family uh, fighting uh, against, against Russia. So it's not possible to sort of base a, a negotiation, I believe, with Russia, uh, 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 one that will be um, sustainable. 
on this false basis of trying to sort of find a way of accommodating this false identity in one part of Ukraine. Yes, you know, Ukraine, we have to give it all the means that it can be independent and sovereign and everything and have an identity as Europe um, when it isn't. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's, the Russians cannot accept to be told that they are sort of Asian and alien and that the, you know, that they are being um, treated in this way because they're not human, which is precisely the words that were being used in that case. Um, so the only thing it seems to me to go do is to go back to that great omission from the post-war period, that there was never a proper treaty at the end of the Second World War, that it was just, you know, left hanging because <coughs> there were understandings and... <coughs> America said, <coughs> not an inch beyond the German frontier will we go. And people may, I mean, Russians may complain that their own leaders were uh, remiss and not, you know, nailing all this down better. But the fact is that this is the lacuna um, that really is, is at the bottom of getting an idea of where are, is the, you know, the degree, what is the frontier of security interest, particularly as, you know, it's no longer just West Asia, it's now the heartland. I mean, it's Central Asia and West Asia, and Russia and China have interests there. It's not just, you know, separate within the stance and things like this. So really, it can only be when there is a proper discussion about how to find a modus vivendi between the Western sphere uh, of its interests and the sphere of interests that are represented by the heartland. It's going back to Mekinda, but in a, in, you know, up, uprated for the changes that have taken place in this period when we now have, you know, the heartland becoming perhaps the major pole of power in the next era. So that was really the point of it and how identity has been <coughs> hijacked. But it means that <coughs> all is calling for, uh, in America, calling for a frozen conflict and that we should just freeze it and you know, give a little bit of weapons to keep um, the Ukraine going, and then, you know, ask them to sort of negotiate with Russia. I mean, you know, they cannot do it on the basis that is being insisted on um, by the ultranationalists um, in West Ukraine, that they have a complete, that they are Europeans and are not any part of this Asian project and that they want to be kept quite separate from them and that they don't trust and don't like and intend to remove their influence from their lands to the extent that it is possible. That's not a basis for, for, for negotiations, I believe. I think, I think that's absolutely right. Just a few quick points. Uh, I first started to encounter uh, the kind of literature and language that you've just been talking about from about around the time of the Orange Revolution. I was reading in English, because that's where I have to read it, um, things that were being written among some people, some people, not everybody, in Ukraine at around that time. And I remember being absolutely astonished by some of the things that I read. And I also remember, by the way, having a very bitter row with somebody from Ukraine at around that time on those specific issues. And this person denying to me, I remember that you know, even in the 17th century, Russia was a European country, or that it was referred to um, in the 17th century in Europe as a European <laughs> country. <with laughs> emperor, emperor. And I remember that I pointed out to him that Shakespeare actually references Russia and that Hermione in The Winter's Tale, in fact, 
Russian and refers to the fact that her father is the emperor of Russia, which basically ended that discussion rather abruptly. But I, I've been aware of this literature. I'm sure Glenn has encountered it and it's become more pervasive and more widespread with every single year that has uh, happened since um, the Orange Revolution of, I think it was in 2004. And it's been very disturbing. And it's been very clear to me that these are two inc irreconcilable things. Uh, what the Russians stand for and what the Ukrainians or what these people in Ukraine want, it's like fire and water. They simply will not mix and nor can they coexist together. I think that is absolutely clear to me, and it's been clear to me for a very long time. I think the Russians have had a lot of trouble accepting this. I think that they've been very resistant for very long to the idea that Ukraine has been going in this direction. I think they do understand it now, and I think it is one of the reasons why they see this very much today as an existential issue and why the Russians, like the Ukrainians, are saying a freeze of the conflict is impossible. It is simply not going to happen. It is um, something that we cannot accept or countenance in any way. But there was the other thing which you talked about, which is about Galen and about his organisation and its effect in the West. And this is something I have to say that I'd not really thought about. I never really imagined that we'd had all of these traces in the West from this time. And I think the first thing I would say about Galen is that he was clearly a very able man, mm -hmm. but ultimately he was unsuccessful. He was not a successful person <laughs> in the advice he gave to the German leadership of that time. <laughs> you mentioned the fact in your article that he was consistently underestimating what the Russians could do. And it seems to me that these, this distorted stereotyping of the Russians, this idea that they're incompetent, that they're chaotic, that all of those things, uh, well, could it be that we've so internalized Galen type thinking and you could see where the identity issues might come in, that they're now having an effect on our own ability to carry out objective assessments. I think you're exactly right, unfortunately. I think it has sort of permeated unseen, not consciously, but unconsciously into the in in in, in into the ability. And as I say, that you know, recall that at that time. Um, between the two wars, um, uh, there was the sort of great sort of shift to social Darwinism and other influences that was making sort of German identity and the need for German's ability to sort of reassert itself as a great power. Um, and therefore, you know, to do denigrate, I mean, you know, having lost the, the war, in terms of Russia. I mean, there's, you know, always, I mean, look at the West's view about Vietnam. No, we didn't lose the war. The politicians lost the war. I mean, if you'd left, I mean, the generals, I mean, you know, West Point, all, 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 all there are about four books written to say, you know, that the, the war was never really lost. It was just that, you know, if America had been allowed to do what it, you know, should have done, I mean, so, you know, maybe these things are sort of, you know, coming in. And certainly we've seen this sort of massive, under, I think it's been the underestimation of Russia has been also much affected, um, of course, um, by the outcome of the, the, um, the Cold War and Fukuyama's um, end of history meme. That's had a big effect, clearly. <clears throat> On the on 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 the way uh, of thinking, but it goes back even further. It was uh, a long time ago. I mean, the story of Russia being weak. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but was first promulgated. Uh, 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 one of the Tsars, the Tsar, I think that we're talking about 1760, 1770, married a Polish. You're a historian, probably know. Married a Polish. Uh, girl, 
and she was virulently anti-Russian. And there was this great um, um, fake letter that was created at the time, which said that, you know, that uh, essentially Russia was uh, a paper tiger. Mm. And, and then Bonaparte took it up. And then Galen took it up, and now much of the Western establishment has taken it up uh, as being a you know a sort of continuing sort of theme. Anyway, these things uh, uh, track on. Well, it does remind me a bit about the, the rhetoric as well. I uh, from uh, Nazi Germany because I often cite uh, Victor Klemperer, who was uh, a Holocaust survivor, uh, Jewish, and the, uh, an author. And he wrote much about the distinctive languages of the Nazis in which towards the Jews. And he said they were very dual. E either they were scornful derision of, because of their inferiority of the Jews, so they were scornful, uh, you know, they're hopefully backwards, uh, almost like insects. On the other hand, there was, uh, they, there was also this panic-stricken fear that civilization would not survive them. And I'm um, wondering if uh, Galen uh, was able to transfer this uh, a bit into the current discourse on Russia, because we do the same. Either they're hopefully backwards, you know, they're coming, stealing the toilets and taking chips out of our washing machines. At the same time, they, <coughs> they determine all our elections, all our referendums, they may conquer Europe at any time. So either the fighting us, uh, fighting Ukraine with shovels or with hypersonic missiles. It's either those uh, two extremes. And uh, uh, yeah, but I don't know, also recall a speech, a speech by Christopher Hitchens, actually, when he pointed out that uh, Galen's uh, huge influence on uh, America's intelligence community, that this had introduced something uh, yeah, very ugly in, into the U.S. But uh, but I, I see this same uh, racial rhetoric enter sometimes because um, I'm not, you, pro you probably heard Sweden's foreign minister, Carl Bildt. He, mm -hmm. In 2014, as they were taking to the streets about the time the, before Yanukovych was toppled, he, he went out on Twitter and he wrote that yeah, on the streets tonight is this Eurasia versus Europe, repression versus freedom. You know, this is uh, yeah, civilization versus the barbarians. And uh, uh, and even uh, after, in, after in 2022, he repeated similar ideas. He pointed pictures of orcs versus you know white knights, and and it's important to see that this goes back to the very radical uh, xenophobic mm. policies of they had in Western Ukraine, because from that perspective, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainians and Russians do not share a common civilizational cradle from Kievan Rus. Instead, Kievan Rus is the only the heritage of Ukraine, while the Russians are the ancestors of, you know, the Golden Horde, the mm -hmm. you know, barbarians from the East. And mm -hmm. that's why they always need this uh, ethnic uh, uh, Asian barbaric identity assigned to the Russians. As opposed to the European and civilized of the uh, mm -hmm. of the Western Ukrainians, it's just interesting to me that this is uh, that this is becoming uh, spilling over a bit uh, into the West because uh, we we used to talk in similar racial terms. Uh, John Maynard Keynes he used similar you know expressions, mm -hmm. uh, even Churchill to some extent. But uh, after the World War II, we began to define us versus them more in terms of ideology as opposed to being because. For, for the centuries, we talked about you know East versus West, West as being civilized versus uh, uh, you know inferior Asiatic peoples. But you know for the past eighty years, we we stopped it. It just feels like it's coming back to some extent. Oh, this is the bigger picture, and I think it's very important you've touched on that because this is. I just hinted at it a little bit in saying how you know you see Europeans talking about our European family against. Russian values of autocracy or whatever they how they not undemocratic and auto, autocratic, um, but uh, I think that the, the point about this is that um, I think that what we're seeing and what was intended by some elements was that the sort of Ukrainian, if you like, um, position iconic standing for all Western values, woke values, modern values, technological, digital values, that that was to be set against Russia. But it is also sort of being absorbed uh, by Europe and being presented by Europe to the point at which we will soon come to a, a if you like, 
you know, what will the big war be against? It will be one of European values against Russian, if you like, values of that are, uh, if you like, regressive and are religious, uh, implying that rel religious values are backward. I mean by that, uh, uh, of course, uh, I don't mean it myself. I'm saying it as how it's presented and that they're not capable of, of modernity. Um, and so, you know, as we, you know, I think we were heading into that direction really until, uh, until the offensive collapsed. Uh, and then, you know, Russia is now in, 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 in a stronger position. You probably saw at Valdai um, when you were there. I mean, very much more confident in, in its promulgation of its identity and its, its inheritance. But I feel Europe is slipping back very much into a sort of rather, um, rather narrow perspective. And, um, you know, I, when I was working for the uh, high representative in, in um, Israel-Palestine, I mean, European policy at that stage was, you know, we want to be able to facilitate a solution between the two peoples, find uh, a way of sustained uh, peace. Um, not very easy, not likely. But um, the, you know, w when I see the first thing that I saw on, on Saturday, von der Leyen coming out and sort of saying, unreservedly, we stand only with Israel. We put, you know, all our buildings are going to be colored in colors of, of, um, of Israel. Um, you know, it rules the European Union out from having a role to play with the rest of the Middle East and with Russia and parts who have a more nuanced understanding mm -hmm. of, of what has, you know, happened um, on that land between those two peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just sort of paints them into wear Europe and wave flags and we'll dress up in yellow and blue to, to represent Europe. Uh, and this makes it much harder for, I think, um, for Europe to find the ability to come to terms, which eventually it'll have to do with Russia and with the heartland powers, assuming a much bigger role in the world. They, they'll have to undo some of the, the sort of rah, rah, rah language of, yeah, 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 we're here, we're pursuing this. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to do. But can I just say, there's also a, a very interesting contrast now, which is, um, I mean, Glenn was in Valdai, but Putin delivers this very interesting speech. He covers much of the ground that he's already covered before. But he's now presenting what I suspect is a Russian consensus about themselves, which is that in contrast to this very exclusive one, which is the one we see in Ukraine and to some extent in Europe and the West, the Russian view of themselves is becoming more inclusive. They say we're a country, we're a civilizational state, we include within ourselves people of many different ethnicities, many different religions, but that is what we are. That is what we, that's what makes us strong. That makes what makes us, you know, the kind of country that not only we are, but which we want to be and which we will want to develop. And it, it, it's a very sharp contrast, and it's one that's founded, I would say, on Russian history. It's also not just very different from the one that we had in the West. We are, we're developing, we're retreating into, into the West, and you know, people like Morel talking about we're, we're the garden, they're the jungle. Robert Kagan in the United States has apparently said the same, same kind of thing. Um, but, of course, it's also different, I would say, from what the Soviet Union was in the sense that the Soviets did have an internationalist vision. But, as I thought Putin also correctly said, it was a class-based vision in some respects. It was international, working-class solidarity whereas now the russians are saying well we've got to move we no longer 
thinking in those terms anymore. We're talking more about civilizational blocks, but blocks which are in inclusive and which seek stability and which are prepared to relate better to each other. And it's a it's a it's a sharp change. Mm. Uh, well, I think it's supported particularly by the if you look back at um, Europe and our European strength. That period where everything flourished, trade and commerce and everything, it flourished because there was cultural competition. Yeah. All the city states competed against each other, Siena against Florence, against all the states and trying to be more culturally advanced. So it was cultural, if you like, uh, competition that, that actually gave the energy and the impetus uh, to 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 Europe to to move forward, not conformity, not sort of the dead hand of you know um, single messaging. Um, it was very different. So um, I think that uh, Russia has uh, uh, has done that and and is already moving beyond because I think that is the way we can see this even in the United States that it's moving away from simply you know blue red class uh, differences. Politics is taking um, a very different course um, as it's focusing more on sort of very essential values uh, about life, about, you know, uh, marriage and families and the role that they play in societies uh, and about work. All these things are no longer sort of class-based but are, are, are sort of based in, in uh, cut across uh, and intersect, and I think he's got the as usual. He's picked up and got the scented the the wind direction exactly right. It reminds me of uh, a lot of what was stated a century ago in the 1920s. At that point, you had uh, a lot of the Russian conservatives who had been forced to leave. Well, what was then the Soviet Union. They, they envisioned when the Marxist project would unavoidably fail at some point that they would become a more conservative Eurasian state. Uh, so also leaning more towards uh, yeah, diversity of identities within uh, and, and ethnicities within, within uh, Russia. And, uh, of course, they, they took different turns towards uh, liberalism instead in the 90s. Uh, but uh, uh, no, but uh, the civilizational diversity it, that, that that topic did stick out because it for me it uh, rings it, um, it it almost sounds like a call for a return to Westphalia because once you have calls for universalism, uh, you know the universalist claim of the United States for you know the uh, for liberal values, then this becomes a, a, a legitimacy, if you will, for for. Uh, um, uh, for uh, sovereign inequality in which you know you can interfere in domestic affairs of other countries that's why i thought that the russian uh, or putin's argument in favor of diversity of civilization suggesting each civilization is is unique it, it, it would advocate for uh yeah sovereign equality in accordance with australia <laughs> and i also see similar <laughs> similar rhetoric coming out of China, because they have the Global Civilization Initiative, which is uh, almost yeah, exactly what Putin said in Valdai. And now you hear the Indians also calling themselves a civilizational state. So there is a lot of the same uh, yeah. rhetoric coming. Yeah. I, and I think, you know, equality is the, not perhaps the best word, but sort of parity. You know, you can be big or small, but are you treated as having something of value in its own right that is perhaps not the same in terms of its commercial success, but that you treat others with esteem for what they stand for, um, whether they're big or small. And I think that sort of sense of parity is, is, is very clear from what, you know, R Russian thinking is now moving towards, you know, that you treat the, all the states with esteem and parity and treat them as equivalents or on a par, if you like, with you in terms of esteem and your position in the world. It's very interesting. And uh, we, you, you, I mean, you've been, you referenced the heartland. And of course, when one mm. talks about the heartland, that 
brings us back to Mackinder before the First World War. But he's sort of about, I, I think this is a fair characterization of Mackinder, but he saw it very much in terms of power, that he who controls the heartland controls the world. Mm. But the Russians, who ultimately, they are at the core of what you might refer to. I mean, you won't just refer to it as the heartland. It's Mackinder's heartland. Mm. They don't seem to be seeing it in those terms at all. They see the heartland as instead not, you know, out to dominate the world in the way that Mackinder imagined, but rather to stabilise. It's it's to bring together people in a sort of much more um, stable way. Everybody respects everybody. Everybody works and looks for mutually acceptable solutions. There seems to be very much a Russian catchphrase at the moment, but one can see what they mean. But everybody treats everybody with respect. There's a there's a comment that Putin again made, I think he said, you know, that we're, we're respected because we respect people. We respect the others, so they respect... Parity, them. precisely what I'm saying. It's parity of esteem. Esteem. You, you provide people... I, I remember saying that so early on to, uh, to Senator Mitchell long ago, um, about the Northern Ireland thing, rather than I said, the most important thing to any person, any human being, is whatever his job, whether it is low or high, that society, the, co the community, gives him esteem in, in that work and treats him as a, a valuable member. <coughs> <coughs> whether it's a local community or... <coughs> A global one. And on your point on Mackinder, I think the key thing that, I mean, I think what Putin has grasped and, and Russia and China are, are grasping, uh, are, are implementing, not grasping, they've got it long before I do, um, is, is the sense that, um, you know, there are times in human life when sentiments start to turn and shift and what was accepted and sort of unquestioned and left, you know, um, in stasis. Suddenly, sentiments shift. And I think what they understand is, so what we're dealing with is a sort of trying to deal with a collective psyche. I mean, not quite in the Jungian way, but a collective psyche of, of human beings. It's, it's, it's easier now because we have so many means of instant communication. And I'm not talking about propaganda, info war. I'm talking about understanding the shift in the way and which direction, the directionality of, of the shift in, in, in people's psyche. And I think they've hit it immediately in terms of Africa, in terms of, um, you know, the global south. They understand the shift in psyche that has taken place there. The sort of sense, no, you can hit back. You not don't have to be a, a sort of, you know, hit over your head and be a, a subjective person. You can hit back, and it's important to do that. And I don't mean that in a pointless way, but in the sense of trying to reassert a sense of personal sovereignty, because collective sovereignty only comes when people have a sense of personal sovereignty. So I think all of that is, I mean, uh, the sort of sense of that this is not a war in Mackinder's time of naval power, land power, tanks, ships, um, the literal Western way of thinking, but have taken it to a sense of a sort of a, a, a meta-consciousness. I'm just inventing the word for the moment, but I mean a meta-consciousness on how to interact with the meta conscious and they've got it they've got the feel that this is shifting and they know how to deal with it and are working with it whereas the west is still stuck very largely in a in that sort of mechanical uh, way of thinking but uh, that that being said some of the uh, i feel like some of the ideas of Mackinder are still uh, built into this uh, well collective consciousness, if you will, because uh, 
um, as the you know the Russian Eurasianists of 1920, they're very much built on Mackinder. Their idea was this yeah. maritime power versus land power. They saw the maritime powers as being inherently imperialistic. They said because if you're going to rule, but, uh, if you're going to rule Eurasia from the periphery, then you have to well divide and conquer. This has been the common rule since you know the Napoleonic continental system. But uh, essentially, what well, what they're seeing the Eurasian identity is as being the necessity to to cooperate with others. Because the only way, you know, while countries like China and Russia might have different formats for Eurasia, none of them can achieve their goals without in, har, without harmonizing and cooperating with the other. So, so you see this, uh, instead of, for example, keeping the Iranians and Saudis apart, their benefits comes from if they're able to resolve the differences, if they want to be able to have relations with one without alienating the other. But again, I'm not sure if that would translate into a... No, it, it is. Uh, but I mean, you know, you, you can't walk away from Mackinder entirely. And we don't, um, because both in the BRICS and in the West, everyone is trying to establish military posts at the choke points of trade. I mean, because whether it's at the Hormoz or whether it's at the Suez Canal, I mean, look at all of the expansion of the BRICS was, um, you know, carefully sort of um, if you like, bookending the, the, the Straits of Hormuz. Then Ethiopia is a, on the crucial point. Egypt controls parts of the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal. I mean, this is Makinda think, I mean, essentially. So it hasn't gone, but I'm just saying that it's been surmounted in a way where what you see in, in, in Russia, that it's, you know, the, uh, it's still there as a sort of base level, but I mean, they've moved above that and moved out of the literalism. And this is where I, I, I will, I personally will end, which is to come back to what you were talking about, which was earlier about the fact that we never had a treaty at the end of the Second World War. We've never had a proper establishment of a structure of peace in Europe. We have we had the Helsinki, Helsinki process, which is a sort of pale imitation of a treaty, but not a real one, or at least so I feel. And given that the Russians are thinking in this way at the moment, and I, I, I think you're right, I think that is a general trend, and I think that will probably continue and consolidate. It actually, if we are sensible in Europe, which is debatable, and in the West, well, actually, that does, it seems to me, offer a route towards eventual, eventually some kind of reaching of a modus vivendi with the Russians, in, in perhaps even enshrined by some kind of treaty process, which is that you know, they, they are not seeking to dominate Europe. That doesn't seem to be part of their agenda at all anymore. Arguably, perhaps it never was, or at least not in the way that um, we thought it was. But clearly, it's not what they're looking at or thinking about now. So if we leave them alone, they will leave us alone. If we respect them, they will respect us and vice versa. So there is actually, you think it through, there is actually a potential, eventually, if we could put all these identity issues that you were talking about, all of these ideas that we've perhaps taken from the mid-20th century, from what was being thought in Germany and in Central Europe at that time. If we can get past all of that, there is a way forward. Well, uh, John Kennedy almost did it. Yeah. He almost did it. He was blocked to begin with. They cornered him. They tried to block it. But he did it without consulting them, and uh, he met a, a positive reaction, and something happened. But yes. then, of course, he was killed. Yes. Well, um, we're almost up to an hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what um, you think, Glenn, but I think that this... I think my voice probably has reached its uh, its <laughs> limit. Too. So I hope it's... Uh, I, an immensely I'm... stimulating pro program, um, Alistair. And by the way, uh, that article is a brilliant article, which I would really recommend okay. people read. And they will find references to John Kennedy there and his speech. 
I be I recently reread that speech, by the way, and it is an extraordinary speech, mm. the greatest speech an American president since the Second World War has made, mm. in my opinion. Mm. But anyway, it's there, it's in, it's discussed by Alistair in that article. On my behalf, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you for setting it up. Thank you.